Hello everybody, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, this will be a lecture in three parts and the first part is about ecological literacy. As our new century unfolds, it is becoming more and more evident that concern with the environment is no longer a single issue. It is the context of everything else, of our lives, our businesses, our politics. The great challenge of our time is to build and nurture sustainable communities, that is, social, cultural and physical environments in which we can satisfy our needs and aspirations without diminishing the chances of future generations. At the Center for Ecoliteracy, we spent the last 15 years or so developing a special pedagogy for teaching the knowledge and skills that are necessary to build and nurture sustainable communities. We call it Schooling for Sustainability. It is a pedagogy that offers an experiential, participatory and multidisciplinary approach. Now, we are asked sometimes, why all this complexity? Why don't you just teach ecology? Well, I'm going to try it to show you that the complexities and subtleties of our approach are inherent in any true understanding of ecology and sustainability. The concept of sustainability is now more than 25 years old. It was introduced by Lester Brown in the early 1980s. And since then, it has often been distorted co-opted and even trivialized without, uh, by being used without the proper ecological context. So I think it is worthwhile to reflect for a moment what sustainability really means. What is sustained in a sustainable community is not economic growth or competitive advantage or anything like that, but the entire web of life on which our long-term survival depends. In other words, a sustainable community is designed in such a way that its ways of life, businesses, physical structures, technologies and social institutions do not interfere with nature's inherent ability to sustain life. Now, to design such a community, obviously, we first have to know how does nature do it? How does nature sustain life? It turns out that this involves a new ecological understanding of life, as well as a new kind of thinking, thinking in terms of relationships, patterns and context. Indeed, such a new understanding of life has emerged over the last 25 years or so. At the forefront of contemporary science, the universe is no longer seen as a machine composed of elementary building blocks. We have discovered that the material world ultimately is a network of inseparable patterns of relationships. That the planet as a whole is a living, self-regulating system. The view of the human body as a machine and of the mind as a separate entity is being replaced by one that sees not only the brain, but also the immune system, the bodily tissues, and even every single cell as a living cognitive system. Correspondingly, evolution is no longer seen as a competitive struggle for existence, but rather as a cooperative dance in which creativity and the constant emergence of novelty are the driving forces. And with the new emphasis on complexity, networks and patterns of organization, a new science of qualities is slowly emerging. Now I have outlined this whole new understanding of life that is now emerging in science by just giving a few keywords. To elaborate this would take a whole course of maybe a week or two. What I want to do now 
is to illustrate this new scientific understanding of life just by going to the very core of it and asking the age-old question, what is life? And let's uh, restrict ourselves to just biological life. What is the difference, in other words, between a rock and a plant, or a rock and an animal or human being or microorganism? Now, to understand the nature of life, it is not enough to understand the contents of a living system. If you go to biologists or look at biology textbooks, they will tell you, well, living systems consist of cells. All life is either individual cells or multicellular organisms. And then within those cells, there are special molecules called macromolecules, long chains of atoms with a carbon base and molecules like um, enzymes or other proteins, DNA, RNA, lipids, and so on. And in fact, some biologists today say the defining characteristic of life is DNA. So uh, all you have to do is look for DNA. If there's DNA, the system is alive. If you don't, don't see any DNA, it's not a living system. Well, that all sounds very simple, but the problem is that when an organism dies, the DNA doesn't go away. It's just a molecule and it stays within that dead organism. So the existence of DNA alone is not enough. It's of course very important, but it's not enough to define life. The essential difference between a living organism and a dead organism or non-living organism is what sages and poets throughout the ages have called the breath of life. In modern scientific language, this process is called metabolism. Metabolism is the ceaseless flow of energy and matter through a network of chemical reactions, which enables a living organism to continually generate, repair, and perpetuate itself. In other words, metabolism involves the intake, digestion, and transformation of food. Now, this is the central characteristic of life. And let's look at a few examples of living organisms, beginning with bacteria, single-celled organism. In those individual microorganisms, the cell is surrounded by a membrane that controls the intake of nutrients and excretion of waste. It lets certain substances in and keeps others out. And in doing so, it maintains the integrity, the molecular integrity of the cell. So we see the identity of single-celled organisms. Cellular identity is shaped and sustained by the intake of food.